Hi. Hi. That was kind of incredible. Thank you. Ooh, I'm glad you thought so. <laughs> I'm not even going to try and pretend to play um, intelligent, intelligence gymnastics with you. So I'm going to maybe start and strip it all the way back and start from layman's terms in terms of process. Sure. In everyday terms. Yep. Um, kind of just routine, waking up in the morning, when the idea is in place, when it's in place, is it already mapped out in your head before you put pen to paper? Keys? Yeah, I think it's sort. I think again, again, it, it sort of depends. If I'm writing uh, alone, uh, I I can be quite free. Uh, I have uh, my little notes about my three act structure or my five act structure, depending on the piece, um, that I can c kind of go back to and, and tweak. But I am sort of finding it as I go, and I'm allowing myself that. If I'm writing um, for a studio, like if it, you know, I, I've never written something like for hire, but I have been paid, commissioned to write my own piece, um, and so therefore I do need to have a treatment for the studio to be sure that they actually like what they're paying me to write. Um, uh, uh, but you know, with 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 things on spec, I will just kind of let it happen. Uh, when I'm writing with another writer, it's a, it's essential that we outline things very clearly before we put pen to paper. But again, things evolve and the, the whole sandcastle metaphor, whatever. So then writing with another writer, writing with your brother on the lighthouse, um, picking up on the idea of dialect and naturalism. And you see even the last scene, we've just taken a look at. There's a poetry to it and a rhythm to it and a beat to it. Yeah. Um, how do you, A, create that in a way that's communication between two people and talking to a conversation, but then write that with another person? Uh, you, I don't know, you just do. <laughs> I, 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 uh, sorry, I think my, I mean, my brother and I know each other pretty well. We're brothers, so that helps. And I think, you know, in, the, in both writing with my brother and with uh, the Icelandic poet and novelist Sion, who's uh, a much better writer than I am, it's like I'm, in, I, I, I'm in finally sort of like in charge, you know, and that does help clarify things. Um, uh, though both of them are incredibly talented, and I respect them so much. So if they're really telling me like I've made a mistake, I, you know, I, I, I listen. But I think um, it's you just kind of toss things back and forth, and I, you know, with uh, with, my, with my with my brother. Um, we're 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 pretty well uh, aligned on what this what, what this was, and I think sometimes um, when we're working with with Sion, I tend to like gild the lily, and he tends to say you can take it back a bit with that Nordic sensibility. Um, and with the lighthouse, you did kind of undersell it in the way that you said that it was just maybe every scene is a similar conversation between two people with a different power play. And it's so not that. It's so kind of um, mental gymnastics, again, between the two of them. And ever so carefully and cleverly leads to this incredible finale. So the time of kind of placing that and writing with your brother again, those scenes together, how did you kind of piece together a story and an arc and a narrative to get to something that, you know, essentially is two people in one situation? So I had that, that basic plot I mentioned from Small's uh, Lighthouse in Wales. Then, uh, you know, very quickly I was like, okay, there needs to be a mer mermaid in the movie, and she needs to be washed up on shore at the midpoint. And there's a mystery in the light, and there's a foghorn, and there's like all these bits and bobs. And I wrote some stuff. Uh, and then years passed, and my brother and I were like, got together to really write this thing. So I gave Max the sort of 11 pages that I had written, all my notes, I rewrote them in a way that could be decipherable to another human being. Uh, and then I gave him a list of movies to watch and books to read. And a month later, we reconvened and started talking about how to make sense of this. And we talked and talked and talked and talked. And then Max wrote an outline. And it wasn't great. And Max wrote another outline. Because I was also writing two other things at the time. Um, so that's the other thing is like, I um, like I really am enjoying collaborating with other writers, but I've found that because the movie business is so tricky, if I don't have more than one thing going at the same time, I'm 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 painting myself into a, a corner. Um, so so uh, so anyway, back to this. So then Max wrote a third outline, and Act One and Two 
were strong. Act three was not working. We, we, we just couldn't find it. Um, uh, and, but I said, you know, we're in good enough shape. So Max, break act one. So he wrote act one, I revised it. Then he wrote act two, I revised it, and then I was so excited that I wrote act three and we actually had like a movie. And from there, we just passed it back and forth, back and forth. But once we had had, once we had found that, uh, that first version, like we, I, like we realized that we had kind of retold some, some myths by mistake. Uh, not by mistake, but just by whatever, by the muses um, uh, that we were conjuring. And, and so we said, okay, well, let's, let's amplify our knowledge on Prometheus and Proteus and uh, Triton and Neptune, and then see how we can further infuse the next draft with our knowledge of all that stuff. Uh, and that led to some fairly heavy-handed imagery in the movie, but um, sometimes you just have to go with it. Go with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you kind of mentioned as well when you were talking about the idea that you have been researching, 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 and then um, that you're perhaps um, in kind of the 17th century or the 19th century, and to you it might not be resonating today, but then obviously it has resonated with audiences today and thematically with the witch and kind of being a portrait of the dark feminine and with um, the lighthouse looking at toxic masculine, masculinity. Did you, do you realize that when you're writing that this? this uh, yeah, no, I, I was trying to say like, like no. no. Uh, when, you're done, when you're done writing, like you can, you can see it, but, but not in, it, it, not when, I, I, don't, I know, I don't see it. When and I'm how not. important is it for you to have kind of something that obviously is, is so embedded in a specific time and space, but then can have some sort of, I don't, you said it's not about message, but. Well, it's, it's just like, so I'm, I mean, I'm after this kind of uh, archetypal story. Uh, I can't know if it's going to work for, forever. Um, but um, the, the best stories stick around. There's a reason why people talk about Oedipus. There's a reason why people talk about Hamlet. There's a reason, I'm not going to keep going, but, you know, uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, who was uh, a prominent uh, Jungian, said that, like, Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales are going to die because they aren't, like, essentially human the way many of the uh, grim fairy tales are. And that, like, Hans Christian Andersen was, like, a, a demented Victorian and his, uh, his stories are too wrapped up in his Victorian uh, uh, repressions and whatever. And she's right. Like, The Little Mermaid is kind of sticking around thanks to Disney, uh, but the Hans Christian... F Anderson fairy tales are not being told at the same frequency as they once were. Um, uh, is the lighthouse a grim fairy tale? No, <laughs> uh, but but I guess the idea though is that you're trying to have something that that resonates in, in any time, and I think by by being by trying to <clears throat> have it be an all about the time period in which it's set in instead of making any kind of concessions for a contemporary audience, I feel like I have a stronger chance of it being timeless. Because obviously, as much as I try to get in, into the, the mindset of the people of that period, it is slightly impossible. So, so it finally is only going to be a mirror of the mindset of today, uh, but, uh, and, and, but, you know, you, using the, that the lens of the past to to reflect back on ourselves. I mean, I, that's a little, <laughs> but I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah. There's still spaces for interpretation because obviously you can't yeah. ever know. Yeah, you can't ever know. Um, I'm gonna skip in a little bit forward in terms of kind of the visual look and how that relates back to the writing in terms of looking at kind of the notion of four by three. Do you have all of those things in your head and in place when you begin the writing process? It, and then how does that affect kind of the writing, obviously the claustrophobia of the lighthouse and how is that having an impact on the way you write? Yeah, I mean, the, the aspect ratio, um, it got a little smaller over the years, but, but I always wanted it to be boxy mm -hmm. and I always wanted it to be black and white, 35 millimeter. That's something when I, that I saw when I pictured the atmosphere. Um, and of course, like 
as you move forward, both in the writing and then in development and then in prep, you learn more, things change, you know, and your preconceived notions are not always correct. But, uh, but, but you, find, you make choices that are closer to your original intentions, even if they weren't your preconceived notions about how to articulate your intention. Uh, and yeah, so sometimes I, I, ha I see how it's shot. And, I, and sometimes in certain sequences I write, extremely wide shot, lighthouse tender, like in the middle of the sea, yada, yada, yada. Like close shot, the hull carves through the waves, like blah, blah, blah. Sometimes I'll do that, which again, as a writer director, I can get away with because it's a terrible thing to do otherwise. Um, uh, and, and sometimes I see that and I don't write it because it's distracting to the flow of the scene. Uh, sometimes I just see a scene, a story, and I know that we're gonna have to find it later. Sometimes I see a scene with, that's a complicated action sequence or stunt or a visual effect or practical effect, and I think, okay, how can I write this in an achievable way? And sometimes I think, if you think about writing it in an achievable way, you're not gonna write it. So just write it and you'll figure it out. Uh, and you have to be blind to the realities of, of shooting to, to tell the best story. So then coming back, circling back to the idea of studio commissions or studio notes or producer notes, how does that then have an impact on kind of writing in that way? And do you leave things out and then? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not duplicitous because um, the, the most important thing is that everyone is on the same page. Because if we can't, if we don't, like I try to now, uh, after some experience, say every horrible thing that a studio wouldn't want to hear about what I'm doing, like straight away. And if they're scared at that point, like good, you know. But if they're, but if they're, but if they're still willing to listen after I've said like all the crazy stuff, then 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 we're good to go because I'm not gonna like shock them too much as we as we move forward. I think, um, you know. I used to be very defensive uh, 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 when, when I was younger, uh, and now I'm not in the room. Uh, but when I get my notes, I go home, and I say, they're trying to ruin my movie, and I sleep on it, and then I realize, actually, these are smart. I think, I think that you know, like, um, a lot of times, uh, and this is, I'm sure, common knowledge to you, but a lot of times, the thought behind the note is right, but the note itself is not good. I think. You know, if you have multiple people saying something that is wrong with a scene, maybe they have different ideas about how to fix it. So there might be something, there's probably something wrong about that scene, you know, even if their solutions are poor. Um, and, and, and so it's worth thinking about that stuff. And, and, and uh, you know, and I mean, The Witch, the first draft of, of, of The Witch that was presentable, there was no central protagonist. Um, it was we would fo we followed each of the family members carefully for a period of time, and then the film ended with Thomason. And my producing partners were kind of like, "Look, it's cool. We think it's cool, but it probably cannot be financed. It might be the best version of this movie, what you're doing, but but we think it may never get financed if you do it like this. If you have a central protagonist, I think we can finance this movie." And I was very upset about it again, like at that time, like incredibly defensive, uh, but. I thought, okay, I can make it about Thomason, and I can deal with that. You know, one of the things I don't love about The Witch, though, is I think that there are these kinds of, uh, you can feel that the original version wasn't only her, you know? Uh, and there's good things about that as far as like the world building is concerned, but there's bad things about that as far as like having the best narrative you could have. Then when you at that point go into filming with a kind of script that maybe you're 80, 90 percent happy with. I was happy with the script yeah, at the time. Yeah. You know, now I have my things, but it was. I mean, I had many years because no one wanted to finance it for so long. Like I had many years to like get it in pretty good shape. Uh, I like the script better than the film. Um, I'm going to ask a very superficial question about writing in animals. So you had the goat in the witch, which I believe was kind of kind of troublesome, and then. Seagulls feature very heavily in the lighthouse. Did you think when you're writing that how I'm going to orchestrate? Yeah. So now, uh, now I'm very, very, very cautious about writing animals. Not that I don't do it, but I do a lot of research about like, can these animals be trained? Are they legal to shoot with in the countries that I'm most likely to be shooting in? Like, how, who who trains them? What can they do? Blah, blah, whatever. All this stuff before I 
do that. So I didn't do that with the witch. The goat was a nightmare, and, and you can't train a goat, and don't write a goat in your movie uh, is my biggest tip of the night, um, uh, unless they're just supposed to like stand around and eat stuff they're not supposed to eat. Um, and so then my bro like I, I wanted uh, Pattinson's character killing a seabird to be like the, the catalyst that would bring the storm. Um, but my, and, then my, and, and that inspired my brother to write all these fucking scenes with seagulls. <laughs> and he was telling me about it, and I was like, there's no way I'm going to do that. No, you know? And then he was like, he was like I urge you to read these scenes. I think they're good, and they were great. So, I, I, so we had to have a seagull. But the great news is, like, seagulls are, uh, are incredibly intelligent, and there's three very well-trained seagulls in the UK. So, uh, <laughs> you know, right, right seagulls, right, right way. Um, I want to thank you so much for giving a phenomenal lecture, for creating two wonderful pieces of cinema. I know that we're all really excited to see what you do next. Thank you, Robert Eggers. Thanks. Thanks.